Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the School World Order. I am your host, the Dallas Professor John Kleisick, author of School World Order, the Technocratic Globalization of Corporatized Education. Okay, okay. Yeah, I, 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 I want to switch here. I mean, I, I, I can keep, we can keep going on this for a, for a long time. Uh, but yeah, me too. Yeah, we got like, we're, we're getting close to that time. We got about 40 minutes and I wanted to, maybe we'll circle back to it. Um, but I would like to move to to Hegel and some of the questions that um, that you had proposed last time. Um, I wanted to start off with just like kind of do what we did with the just basic definitions. Um, but maybe we can maybe we can combine it by just jumping into one of the, one of the um, one of the questions that you had posed you or, or one of the challenges you had given me was uh, you had said that um, that the analysis of Hegel as a quote rational theologian is somewhat outdated. Um, can you explain that more? Like I, you know, that that in all of my encounters with reading Hegel and people that have lectured on Hegel, that's always been the, the lens that I have that I have come at him through. So mm -hmm. perhaps I'm uh, perhaps I'm out of date. Can you explain? So how? What are the challenges to this conception of him as a, a rational theologian, and, and what are some of the uh, tenets or uh, examples, mm. maybe passages that, that uh, explicate that? Mm. Yeah, maybe we should here address the term rational theologian first. I mean, this is part of a um, very influential and maybe the oldest way of interpreting uh, Hegel's philosophy. Um, and according to it, what Hegel actually tried to show or yeah, is that there is a sort of rational justification for basic elements of Christian theology, right? That's uh, somehow the um, core of this way of in in interpreting Hegel, okay? And what I mean by outdated here is also, of course, um, somehow ambiguous. Um, current research, that's one meaning of the term, has abandoned this interpretation, which does not mean that it's not true, right? It still could be true. But what I mean by outdated is that is at least um, we should not accept it without qualification, right? Um, so <clears throat> there are, of course, evidences that this interpretation is right because um, Hegel in various of his works claims that the subject matter of philosophy is God. Um, and you gave the quote from the philosophy of right where comparable uh, remarks are to be found. But of course we must wonder what Hegel himself means by God and maybe what he means by philosophy. And here we have to bear in mind his own cultural and historical context. Hegel himself has his roots in the um, German Enlightenment philosophy, um, above all its rationalist um, um, currents, where the main claim was that the strongest justifications for any claim whatsoever are provided by a specific cognitive faculty, which was called reason. Um, and then some people uh, came, uh, it, it dawned on some people that this uh, principle could also be applied to itself. And so we have the problem, which then was addressed by Kant. Uh, if reason really has the capacity to conceive uh, or to just justify the things in their most strongest way. And this issued a very, very, uh, very, um, um, how shall I say, um, strong con con uh, controversial exchange during the 1790s in Germany, uh, where the Romantics above all, and certainly also others, um, uh, question these basic principles of uh, rational philosophy. And that's the one angle Hegel comes from, right? So, and what Hegel tries to do in his philosophy as one, that's one um, root of his philosophy, is to uh, take those elements of, the, of these criticisms, which he deemed to be um, acceptable, and to retain those elements of the original rationalist principle, he again conceived to be acceptable. So what he actually tries to do is to, uh, is to synthesize this early romantic criticism, or maybe the Kantian criticism, and this uh, rationalist uh, principles, right? Okay. 
and as he's a a a as he's heavily influenced by romanticism we have then to take into account um uh, the notion of God in play in Romanticism. That's, of course, heavily influenced by Spinoza's notion of God, right? Um, and that's a sort of notion of God which is mm, quite difficult to square with uh, Christian theology because uh, God here, of course, is a sort of imminent entity, not a transcendent one, but it's just simply the merological sum of everything that exists, the universe, you could say, right? Or the infinite substance. Um, and Hegel accepted this claim for a while, but then himself came to qualify it and eventually tried to abandon this pantheist notion. Uh, but it's quite debated in, in the scholarship how far he discarded it or how far it's still he still accepted it. I mean, when we press Hegel in his lectures on the philosophy of uh, religion, we have a quite ambiguous picture. On the one hand, Hegel tries to defend pantheism, but on the other, he also tries to suggest that he is not at all that uh, near to Spinoza as one would uh, um, uh, assume. Uh, and so he tries somehow to mix into it a, a certain Christian elements. So what I just want to say is this doctrine that, that Hegel himself is a Christian theologian is on, on account of the reasons mentioned itself highly unclear. In some sense, yes, he tries to take in, on board a Christian elements, but on the other, he is heavily influenced by the Romantics and somehow seems to uh, at an attempt to, to synthesize both, uh, both uh, things. So I, as I said, I would not just um, um, rush to a, uh, a rational theological conclusion from that, because the data is quite intricate and complicated in Hegel. Oh, okay. So yeah. So that and that's even and even that critique, you can still. I mean, he might not be a, a rational Christian theologian, but uh, he's still he's still dealing with the concept of God uh, and you know mixing the like the pantheist stuff with the Christian stuff. I imagine you're familiar with the Gnostic tradition of Gnostic Christian tradition. What kind of? Gnostic, G-N-O-S-T-I-C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so, I mean, maybe we could call him a Gnostic Christian rational theologian because, you know, that essentially was, right, with the, with the Manichaeans, right, the idea of duality uh, and sort of, you know, the syncretism, right, mixing, uh, looking at Christianity as, like, this evolution or, like, uh, uh, you know, a, another version of some of the older... Uh, what I guess Christians would call pa pagan mythologies, right? There's you know, parallels to the Bacchaea and things like that. Um, but sort of, right, the, another term that's used is the perennial philosophy, right? Mm. All of this sort of sometimes gets, you know, smashed into the term Gnostic. Uh, but I mean, I, I would totally agree with that. Like, I, I would not consider him a classical Christian theologian. And I know that, you know, he came out of the Lutheran tradition and all that. And, you know, I know that he did write, you know, with his, with his thesis, antithesis, synthesis, he's he also is playing with like the Trinitarian concepts and things like that. But, but you're right that ultimately when he says things like, and I couldn't remember the, the title last time, it's the, right, it was the, the philosophy of right, where he says, uh, basically, God uh, is the state, mar or the state is God marching on earth, right? Like pulling, pulling it, pulling God down through contradiction into, into the physical realm is, right, is not uh, cl classical Christianity. So, um, so, I, so I, I don't even disagree with, with that. Um, yeah, but I, I wouldn't say that Hegel um, is committed at least to saying that, uh, this God is somehow dragged from heaven to earth because according to Hegel, as I pointed out, God is in earth in some way, right? It's an imminent entity which is present in everything. And that's of course the, the how shall we put it, the, the unorthodox Lutheran um, um, origin of Hegel, which was heavily influenced by Spinoza, right? Yeah, um, and that's, you know, so, so right, within the idea, right, re reason, he has like two layers to it, right? Reason is, right, what we interpret the universe with, but reason he also uses with a big R, 
right? And that is, right, the march of the ideas of history through dialectic. And, and in that, he's saying that that is the transcendent part of God. The imminent part of God is, is essentially manifest through our our faculties and our the way that we deal with the dialectics of contradictions in our mental rational faculties those become physically manifest in the society that we build which is represented by the state so for him right it's god coming down from reason big r coming down to reason little r through the dialectic of ideas and then that and then the the sum of that dialectic comes out in right whatever uh laws whatever state apparatus sort of um you know has the basically has the final say at that moment in history right yeah i mean i'm not so, so um, I, I mean saying that that god as, as i said comes from above or that he is somehow how did, did you just put it i don't know um well, they consider him a pan. I've heard, you know, pantheist, but I've also heard this term yeah. penantheist, which yeah. is pedantic to me. But it's the idea that there's the pantheist part where God is in everything, but then there's mm -hmm. also a layer where God is transcendent as well, but mm -hmm. but always coming down. Yeah, okay. Into. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, Hegel is quite explicit on this point that, uh, at least as, as he's using the term transcendent, God is not transcendent. Right. That's quite explicitly in his uh, lectures on the philosophy of religion. Whatever one what one wants to make of that, right? Yeah, but I mean, uh, so okay, so so what you are addressing as rational theologian or the interpretation as a rational theologian is not the common interpretation of Hegel, which um, let's say prevailed until Charles Taylor's large monograph from 1975. So you have a certain idiosyncratic way of reading Hegel, right? Okay, I get it. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of mixing, I guess I'm kind of dabbling in, in all of those different paradigms at, at, at a certain level. Um, mm. and, and, and that quote, by the way, was maybe, this, and this can get us back to what, uh, some of the questions that, uh, that we kind of jumped over. Um, and that is, so, so when you asked me before why I identified Hegelian philosophies with fascism, so one was I had several examples of uh, basically right-wing Hegelians out of, out of Germany. Uh, they're in my book. I know Friedrich Trendelenburg is one of them. Um, and I can't remember the rest of them off the top of my head, but I mentioned them on the last video and people can check that out. And they're also in, in my book. Um, but the other element was that using this principle of, of Hegel, where he's say, saying that, right, that the state is the manifestation of God on earth. And that if you take as in your definition of capitalism, which sounds very similar or really close to what I would call fascism, which is where right, you have the state essentially uh, wielding what you call the monopoly of force or violence for the sake of uh, exploiting surplus goods, right? In other words, the, corp the corporate sector's ability to exploit working people. Effectively, right, the state and the corporation are merged. And so you could also just say that the corporation is the state. So if the corporation is the state, and if Hegel says that, right, the state is God, and a capitalist or a fascist nation, essentially the corporation is God. And, you know, um, that would be how I, another way that I tie not just the, the particular philosophers that were Hegelians who uh, would later lead to the rise of fascism in, in Germany. And in some ways, right, we could also go back to Fichte and, you know, the dialectic, Hegel really got the dialectic from Fichte and, you know, Fichte was the roots of Prussian militarism and that also plays in, but, but, but this other concept of, um, right, the state being God marching on earth, if we can, if we, if we conceive of fascism as corporatism, and I know that we, we, uh, we, we differed a little bit on that and you can chime in here on that. Uh, but if we conceive of it as, right, the corporate state, then the corporation is God. And in effect, to me, that's that's Hegelian, right? Through so the dialectic of state and corporate power, basically the merger becomes corporation as God or state as corporation or state as God, right? And just sort of interchangeably. Okay, so you're trying to infer, um, how shall I say, the acceptance of fascism uh, from certain Hegelian theses, as I understand it. 
I mean, one of your premises was, of course, that um, um, corporations are God or godlike. I mean, this, of course, re requires a thorough uh, justification from the Hegelian corpus, right? So you would have to show that Hegel said something about corporations and more specifically that Alti had the um, tendency to equate corporations with, with godlike entities. I don't know of any passages myself. Yeah, no, no I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm saying that maybe we could use like a post-Hegelian term. What I'm saying is that if we, using the principle of the dialectic and using his conception of the state, when we get through, through a dialectical point in history where the state and the corporate sector are essentially merged into one corporate state, right? That if we, we, we can then still take his conception of the state and apply it to this new dialectical manifestation of, of, of the state in a different form. Okay. But that would now not show that Hegel himself is committed in any way to fascism, right? Right, and I so maybe this is a distinction like you kind of sort of did with the Pope, the pre-Marxist, the Marxist, and the post-Marxist, right? I mean, a lot of those people still, right? I mean, uh, Lenin, Stalin, Mao, right? They would all basically say they come out of the Marxist tradition, right? What you would say that, right? Uh, that that is quite, at best questionable as to what Marx intended. So we could maybe say that Hegel does not intend that or explicitly say that, but if we use some of his principles and we and we follow them into new historical manifestations that perhaps he didn't foresee that if those principles are still at work, then we could ex extrapolate and, um, and and see it at work in that way. Yeah, I mean, a problem of course here is also that Hegel, Hegel's notion of state is not in any way comparable to the uh, notion of the state which is in play in the thesis of corporatism, right? This presupposes of course a highly functionalized, highly yeah, let's say a modern state, right? I mean, he Hegelian state notions are really tightly bound to pre-capitalist notions. So, I mean, it's another problem for an attempted extrapolation. Uh, because, I mean, uh, he he Hegel's notion of state is again quite obscure, but what it amounts to is that it's a sort of a mediating relation between two uh, conflicting spheres in society. On the one hand, markets, as he called it, I think, where, where people are somehow self-alienated by somehow selling their own working force. But I think Hegel didn't have really uh, any capitalist ideas here. And on the other hand, of course, the family, which is uh, um, governed by uh, principles of love and, 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 and respect, right? But that's basically a Hegelian state. I mean, I cannot really see any resemblances between this notion and the notions which fascist theorists of the state like uh, Gentile, for instance, have brought forth. How do you, how, how would you also add, um, how would you incorporate his conception of the slave master dialectic into these spheres? Like how, how would that, how does that play into that? Man, yeah, I mean, that's maybe the high, most obscure passage in this really obscure corpus of Hegel himself, right? I don't know, because I don't know what this passage actually says. And that's the that, that goes for most philosophers. We don't know what Hegel is saying there. I mean, but some researchers, of course, um, try to elucidate these um, questions. Um, one uh, as I mean, but let's say it like this: um, current research on Hegel uh, does not relate in any way to your to the questions you are interested in, right? So they see it rather as a sort of reply to Kant in the sense that Hegel here tries to reformulate a sort of, uh, to, to give a sort of epistemology for undertaking, in order to undertake a sort of um, a metaphysical endeavor, which of course uh, was threatened by Kant himself. And that's, I think, one of the main trends in current research is to look this uh, um, slave master dialectic in this way. Yeah, so, yeah, and I so I asked because I mean, so one of the the way I interpret it, or one of the ways that it could be interpreted, is that um, looking at right everything in dialectic, right, everything being manifest, being uh, a synthesis of conflicting ideas, that the dialectics of slave and master, or the contradictions of slave and master, right, are essentially resolved or otherwise codified or authorized by the state. 
ultimately, right, the state on top basically is the synthesis in which you codify that dialectic. And so fascism being essentially, right, uh, I know we, we differed on the, on the opinions, but right, one of the elements is extreme nationalism and xenophobia, often, you know, ethnocentrism, uh, which means you basically have a caste society or, or basically a slave system, right? And so, uh, you know, is that, I guess I can turn this into a question now, is, is that, is Hegel's slave master dialectic amenable to that conception of the state? Yeah, well, as I said, I don't know, because I don't know what Hegel is saying there, right? I mean, there are people who really um, work on this very passage for, for the whole life. As I see it in my very humble opinion, because I'm not in any way a Hegel scholar, it is not. Because we must, of course, consider when Hegel wrote that passage and when he firstly uh, was explicit about his notion of state, maybe. Um, leaving aside some of his very, very early works. I mean, this passage, of course, with a, a slave mass occurs in his phenomenology of spirit. And his uh, notion of state is explicated uh, later on. I mean, it's not really clear if we can just put those two things together from a, quite, from, from a hermeneutical point of view, right? It's not really clear. And on the other hand, it's quite clear that Hegel here is not in any way speaking verbally. He tries to... Um, express something by way of a metaphor. Um, and we also have to bear in mind here that the terms master and slave uh, refer to um, pretty much a feudalist conception of, 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 of expropriation. So we are far away from the ways of, of, uh, of these uh, very brutal ways of appropriation we, we can uh, observe in in what we could observe in uh, current or in past uh, fascist systems. Right? So it would be very, very hesitant to draw any quick conclusions here, because it's Hegel, <laughs> you know, we never can draw any quick conclusions here. Yeah, because yeah. most of the time it's not clear what Hegel is saying. Yeah, and 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 um, I guess maybe it's important. I guess I I can also point out, and then we'll I want to get to another question um, as as we as we get to the end here. Um, I, I guess it's important to, to emphasize here that I don't necessarily mean that this is what Hegel said and what Hegel meant as much as I mean that this is how Hegel has been interpreted and applied, right? And, and you know, you could say again that that's not Hegelian, that, you know, you're, you're bastardizing his stuff, but I think, you could, I think that there at least is, is enough historical uh, evidence to, to make the case that, right, whether whether uh, appropriately or inappropriately, like that, that it has been adopted in some in some of those ways. And um, looking at those various passages, as much as they write, they they can be sort of mysterious, like most of his stuff. You know, I think I think that the fact that they can kind of be slightly demystified in in that context might, you know, to me that lends some validity to that to that interpretation. And that's. Yeah, but I mean, appearance, appearances can be quite illusory here, I think, right? That's the problem. I mean, what research has shown over the, two, the last 200 years uh, concerning Hegel is that there is no simple interpretation of Hegel due to its very complicated context. And just maybe one final note on that. Um, I spoke about Hegel's uh, um, romantic um, heritage somehow, right? The romantics themselves had a sort of theory about the state and since they uh, had their origin also in the French Revolution, they were always very firm on one point, namely that every state has to protect individual rights and democratic values, right? There are some transformation around 1800 when things go, go, went really wild in, uh, in France, but Hegel himself always stick to that notion. Let me I ask did. this real quick. I, I, I just, this just popped in my head. Would you consider Marx Hegelian? That's a difficult question. I mean, Marx <laughs> meant that he uh, reverted uh, Hegel somehow. It's a difficult question. <clears throat> it depends, of course, what we mean by Hegelian again. Let's just say in terms of the dialectic, right? Obviously, one's an idealist, yeah. one's a materialist, right. so you know, basically yeah. opposite. Okay. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> 
Right, then we, when we think of Hegelian meaning simply that uh, a sort of dialectic plays a central role in metaphysical or epistemological cons uh, considerations, okay. Um, yeah, in this sense, Marx would of course be a Hegelian, right? If we have this very narrow, uh, very thin notion of Hegelianism, because of course he himself ha had a sort of theory of dialectics, which differed in some sense of, from the Hegelian uh, notion, but of course had its roots uh, very firmly in the uh, Hegelian notion of dialectics, for sure. Yeah. Okay, and the reason why I ask is because, right, I mean, I, right, they couldn't, in some ways, they couldn't be more opposite. And you could say Marx wasn't, he didn't do Hegel's, right? All right, Hegel never said anything about, right, the, uh, material forces and stuff. But, right, I mean, you certainly could say that he is Hegelian in the sense of the dialectic. And certainly, right, a lot of people use that uh, framework, you know, to have philosophical discourse, discourse. So, I mean, insofar as Marx can be considered a Hegelian, that, that is sort of the, the line in which I am extrapolating what could be considered Hegelian to essentially the, the fascist sort of manifestation of, of what would become uh, basically what I see as sort of the inversion of the state version of communism, right? I don't see a whole mm -hmm. lot different between Stalin, Mao, and Hitler, except for maybe stuff like nationalism and, you know, ethnocentrism, but otherwise, right, in a lot of ways, uh, very, very similar in terms of merger of state and, and corporate power. And uh, let me, let me move, and you can probably jump on that question with, uh, with this as we, as we come, come around here. And um, so let me, so the other, the other comment, you had made a comment, and when I, I had mentioned that I that I, I said there were many socialists and most of them were Fabians in the early 20th century who were all about eugenics, right? They were they were total totally on board with it. So my first so my first and you had your your response was that you in your conception of socialism that eugenics could could not exist and it is totally incompatible, right? So so this question is two parts, right? And you, you can handle it however you want in whichever order. So one is. Why do you, do you, is in, in your framework, why is eugenics incompatible with socialism? And also, do you, are you familiar enough with the Fabians to, to give me an argument about whether you consider them to be authentic socialists or not? Yeah. I mean, Luigi, do you want to cut the part concerning um, the compatibility of Fabians with socialism or? Yes, I mean, I can do that. Do, so, you have the, do you have the notorious book in front of you? I mean, I, I can uh, do it in the sense, I, I skip the, the basic informations about the Fabian Society as they are a think tank connected to the, to the socialism and go straight into the detail about a very problematic po position uh concerning we can go past the 10 minute mark or, you know i know we were going to say we we're going to end you know so you don't have to rush if you guys got time i didn't mean to cut you off but okay. you know what i mean so you can take your time you don't have to feel like you're trying to squeeze it in okay so here's the reason why fabians aren't socialists in our understanding maybe That's I because just... yeah go on yeah sorry. yes mm, sorry go on go on okay so in the year 1900 the Society of the Fabians, they published a statement written by Bernard Shaw, uh, which goes straight to the point of imperialism. Namely, uh, Shaw argued that the classical liberal political economy was kind of outdated in his opinion, and that imperialism only represented the new stage of international policy. So this is a question of foreign policy in the understanding of the Fabians, um, meaning in the center that Bernard Shaw was quite um, sympathizing with the idea of war and imperialism, which are completely capitalist movements concerning power. Uh, you find that this statement in a book of uh, Mr. Semler. Semler, Bernard Semler, Imperialism and Social Reform, mm -hmm. English Social Imperial Thought. Um, that's the core of, of, the, of the argument 
against mm -hmm. the, and the socialism of the I mean, of course, we, we should also uh, outline the context of the whole thing. I mean, this was a time of war, 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 right? In in um, in, uh, in in Britain. And the Fabian society was quite, it seemed to be a sort of controversy among members of the society how to respond to this um, war ongoings in, in, in Great Britain. And then this ominous, um, uh, what, what did you call it, this manifesto or some, something like that, was issued by Bernard Shaw officially, but uh, uh, commentators were, uh, were in, uh, thought that this was the expressed opinion of the Fabian society itself, right? And this uh, document is called Fabianism and the Empire. And Luigi pointed out some things, but the, there are other aspects of that. As he just outlined, the Fabians uh, voiced through uh, Shaw wanted to wanted actually a Great Britain to enter uh, to to intensify in, in, intensify the war, uh, and mainly with a, a, a imperialist um, um, interest in that. To that end, Shaw thought that a sort of reorganization of the British society was necessary. I mean, you can read off from the from the document, or I can also share my screen if you like. I don't know. So here we go. Can you see that? Oh. Yeah, yeah. And this source is the source is uh, Semmel. Uh, what's the title, Luigi? So that I don't have to. Yeah, it is imperialism. Uh, Imperialism and social reform, English social imperialist thought, 1895 yeah. to 1914. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, and the quote concerning the reorganization of the British society is begins here <clears throat> and just read out. The Fabians were concerned with the effective social organization of the whole empire and its rescue from the strife of uh, classes and private interests, right? Um, what ought Great Britain to do to keep the empire intact and prosperous? So these are uh, quite obviously not uh, aims which are in any way compatible with socialism. Secondly, and more important, it was necessary to keep British military forces in a high state of readiness to defend the empire. The tracks author, Shaw, attacked uh, the brutality and stupid inefficiency of Barrack life, military law, and the British professional soldiery with all the vehemence of a socialist pacifist. He declared the old idea of a standing army obsolete, but asserted that Great Britain had to have a well trained army of fighting civilians and citizen soldiers. Fabianism and the Empire therefore suggested that the Factory Acts be amended to extend the age for half time employment to 21. The 30 hours gained in this way could be spent in a combination of physical exercises, technical education, education in civil citizenship, and field training in the use of modern weapons. Here's a quote again, no payment beyond a supper would be needed to make the drills popular, end of quote. The track concluded in most uh, patronizing and startlingly unsocialist fashion. This at the time when both liberal and conservative parties opposed all forms of compulsory military training. So they went even, even more extreme than the uh, usual so-called non-socialist parties, right? In this respect. It's a quite interesting document, I think. Not very well known, but very, it speaks of itself, for itself. Like what year is it? Um, wait a minute. Roughly is fine. Like, like, like I think it's from the 1960s somehow. Oh, here are some. So, so basically, to use a common phrase, you would you would, you would term the, the Fabians basically as like uh, neoliberals, like they're co-opting the, the socialist rhetoric and the socialist movement, knowing that it's something that is threatening imperialism and capitalism in, in Europe. Yeah, could be. I mean, a bon lettre in some sense, right? But yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, and you know the Huxleys were uh, you know, another term that was used was planning, right? The planning societies, right? And then mm. there was the efficiency movement over here, which mm. um, but had a lot of Fabians in it, right? Um, and uh, in in the in Julian or or Aldous, and I, I can't remember which one, might have been both. You know, they were said, you know, I'm heavily uh, Fabian in, in my leanings. And then you had all the other people like H.G. Wells, right? You guys mentioned Shaw, 
uh, Bertrand Russell, like all these people were either Fabians or affiliated, and they all right said wonderful things about eugenics, right? Even I know uh, people read Brave New World, but if you read his nonfiction essays, which I have all of them here, like there's one called A Note on Eugenics, and he basically mm -hmm. says, yeah, we need a scientific caste system or an intellectual mm -hmm. aristocracy. Mm -hmm. He uses mm -hmm. both those terms, uh, quote, right? Uh, but he was also himself part of the intellectual aristocracy in, in England, right? And, uh, you know, which was not necessarily like the the royal upper crust, but right, was was well enough up there where you could see them as part of the, the effective ruling class. So, so, so then why, um, so just in general theory, why, why, why is in eugenics entirely incompatible with, with, with true socialism from your, from your, your framework? Well, if we take eugenics at its face value, it of course does not respect core values of democracy. I mean, that's quite obvious. And as according to our notion, socialism implies democracy, Socialism is not compatible with eugenics. That would be the quick answer. Yeah, as I say, simple, simple enough. Um, another, uh, and we'll, we can wrap up with this because uh, I know, I know, I, I we uh, we scheduled for two hours. And I don't want to keep you all past that, uh, but I, but I do want to toss this out here. So over here, um, sometimes people use this term techno fascism, right? And um, I use it frequently, right? And I just basically look at it. Uh, my my definition of it is. Right, a form of fascism in which, right, uh, you know, I'm using I'm using corporate fascism as the framework, right, and at this point, right, instead of industrial corporatism, right, we have tech, high tech corporatism, right, and people on the left over here, uh, in particular, even like people socialist leaning people, they they don't like they don't like the term, and I have a theory about why that is, but let me just start with the question, so. What is the role? What would be the role of science in a socialist state, or how how does how does science facilitated through the dance between on the ground democracy and the state apparatus? And you can maybe add technology to that. Is it is it is science sort of just left alone to be this organic thing that happens right like between you know people exchanging their discursive ideas, or does the state have some role in either leveraging that or regulating it? I think that presupposing uh, my notion of democracy, um, science must of course be subjected to uh, democratic processes, but only partially, I think. I mean, science has, the problematic aspects of science, which we can also see now, of course, are that it has can have very large impacts on demo so-called democratic systems or, um, the um, the personal autom uh, the personal autonomy of of people, right? And these are certainly aspects of science which must be totally controlled in a democracy by the people, right? So to ensure that science does not violate these uh, requirements of personal autonomy, these, as we put it before, uh, of these natural rights or the uh, um, the um, right ri rights uh, these process rights let down in the constitution, whatever. Um, but apart from that, it can more or less have its, 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 its free zone as well, I think, right? It's quite as, it's, as it's, 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 it is the case with the uh, citizen himself, right? He's in some sense restricted in his freedom sphere because he cannot just kill uh, someone else. But apart from that, uh, concerning those things which are not um, covered by the law or the constitution, he's free to do as he likes. Yeah. Um, and I Oh, just to, name, to mention one point, and there's one very important uh, aspect, I think, of this uh, democratically related aspect of, of science, uh, which is in some sense constitutive of the whole democratic process. That's the function of providing, um, as far as we know, objective and reliable information, right? Because these democratic processes, as I outlined them, of course, have to have some sort of substratum, they must have some information to process, and this information must be reliable and, and not manipulated. And the uh, one of the central uh, task of science in a true democracy is certainly to fill in this information to to, to somehow uh, fill the processes with the material which can be processed. Right? Yeah, I, I, and the reason why I preface it with that thing about techno fascism is because, um, and you can tell me if, if you're. Uh, 
definition of socialism or, or even communism fits this is um, there's a certain element of people who identify as socialist and communist who essentially their game plan is that all we really need to do is take over the means means of production and be able to produce enough to like give a UBI or to redistribute wealth right to all the working class people. And the means to do that is technology. I should also note that most of these people, as we talked uh, in our emails, right, these are, uh, you, you said it, in Europe that there's like zero COVID lefties, right, or, or socialists, right? And they, they, attention, they essentially are, are okay with, at the very least, if not, right, cheerleading for the, the state abuse of power that we are seeing during uh, all this lockdown stuff, right? And so I, I think that um, the reason why two, two things, why they, why they are kind of on board with the state using uh, the lockdowns and technology to manage the lockdowns has, has something to do with that brand of socialism that identify, that, that, that believes that, right, if we could just take over the means of production through the state, then we can use technology to create a utopia by redistributing wealth. And, and therefore they don't like techno fascism because it does two things, right? It equates state, state control technology with fascism, right? And then, and then it also, right, puts a, puts a uh, darker spin on, you know, another term could just be technocracy, right? So, do you have any thoughts on that that line of thinking from people in, in the socialist uh, or communist uh, camps, like uh, in, just in terms of like your response to it, or you know, how how do you see that 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 type of thinking is either an obstacle or something that needs to be resolved, or or just any thoughts on how it meshes or doesn't mesh with your ideas about socialism? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um... What I would like to address is um, a sort of uh, social explanation of this phenomenon, which um, obviously is not in any way compatible with socialism as I get it, because the aim of socialism cannot be to, how shall I say, to, to intensify capitalist uh, um, uh, um, relations with a clearly uh, autocratic tendency. Um, it must be said that there is a sort of uh, um, precursor to this strain of, of, uh, of socialism, which um, starts in 19th century France with the work of uh, Saint-Simon, for instance, um, where it, it's not really clear whether we should classify him as a socialist. Some scholars do and some do, don't. I mean, uh, uh, Saint-Simon had interestingly pretty much the same ideas as do the uh, self-proclaimed socialists you mentioned, but just um, with a different historical index somehow, right? Uh, for um, uh, Saint-Simon, the main enemy was feudalism, right? Which had to be destructed, which uh, just obstructed the um, benefits that capitalism was supposed to deliver, uh, was obstructing or hindering the increase of production, the rationalization of, uh, of um, industries and so on. And his idea of, of it, uh, achieving this goal, again, was quite similar to um, the, uh, the ideas um, of these uh, people you just mentioned, namely to intensify or to extend the uh, technological innovation uh, pressures and to um, rationalize technological and, or, or, and also commercial uh, procedures, right? So his idea was, if we just press through the um, emerging industrial processes strong enough, feudalism will be destructed, and um, we will uh, we will reach a, a societal uh, condition where the majority will um, get the most benefits and will also have the power. And I th so I think there are many parallels between uh, these phenomena we can see nowadays. Um, and uh, those uh, that could be seen in uh, France of the 19th century. Um, so there are, there are some historical precursors here. But I think there are different reasons for these two phenomena. I mean, Saint-Simon uh, didn't really have a sort of um, capitalist situation around him. In France, we rather have a sort of battle between the old aristocracy 
which uh, try to occupy above all the agricultural sector. And in France, of course, the emerging capitalist classes try to um, get hold of these uh, agricultural um, realms. And so it's rather the context where this comes into. Nowadays, um, <clears throat> this is of course a complex uh, question, but I think <clears throat> it's a result of uh, many years of, how shall I put it, subversion of the labor movement in uh, the US, for instance, which has totally been destructed actually. And uh, also, of course, the attempt of uh, the power elites to, um, to, to reframe any minimal sign of dissent in a way that is compatible with their intents, right? So we have a large structure and large, um, even university professorships and so on and so forth, uh, research projects, which are interestingly uh, tied to the usual culprits, which uh, reframe or soften the, uh, any real dissent into a way uh, which does not hurt the system, but uh, to the contrary, even um, um, extends it, right? So I would see it in this context of the, um, of the, um, of the reframing of, of dissent in order to, um, to, to hinder it from, from, from getting any real impact. But again, the, the details are very complex. I think I'm not sure about that. What might take? Yeah, so let's, let me, uh, let me, let me end with this. I know I said that twice already, but I promise it's the last one here because I want to no go back. No problem with I, that. What's that? No problem with that. Okay, okay, cool. No, I, I wasn't sure what to, I didn't even check to see if you guys had stuff, places you had to be or anything like that. Um, but earlier on, you said that socialism is a, is a pluralist concept, right? And there's lots of different ways in and out of it. And you said that some some brands try to incorporate what you would consider an element of uh, capitalism. Can you explain like what, because I've heard you say that, right, a true socialism can't have capitalism, but then you're saying that some of these, right, uh, conceptions do. So what parts of capitalism do they try to synthesize into socialism? And do you see that as one of the viable approaches to socialism? Yeah, this was rather a sort of slip of the tongue. <laughs> um, um, I mean, there are self-proclaimed movements of socialism, which um, quite explicitly try to reform capitalism. Um, but if you press me on my own true predicate of socialism, I would, of course, deny that, right? I just wanted to um, allude to the fact, maybe misle misle misleadingly, that uh, there's a large portion of socialists, um, the so-called reformists, which from the very beginning always had the aim of just reforming capitalism, just putting, just, just somehow um, 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 etching a bit out to soften its edges and so on, then all will be good, right? But in my opinion, true socialism is not compatible in any way with capitalism. Okay. When you said that there was a, an element of socialism that would uh, that was amenable or that, that, that tried to synthesize parts of capitalism, what I where, where I'm at politically is is this idea that there does have to be a democratic public regulation of the economy. And I don't know what that mechanism actually looks like. And we've kind of walked through different, right, different possibilities. But I also see it as incorporating an element of private property, natural rights, free exchange, right, is a certain element of, right, I mean, it's a regulated, but still a certain element of, of free commercial exchange, where you can exchange your labor on your terms freely and not, right, have it be coerced either through a corporate structure or, or, or you know, like a Stalinist structure, right? To me, that sounds like a blend of socialism and capitalism. Now, I'm hearing your definition. Your definition basically says that's just socialism, right? And then I think that some, some of where we, we might be disagreeing or, or having different exchanges really comes down to how we define things. And I really think that there's also a lot of people, and, and you probably, I mean, you know this with like early socialist movements, right? There was always weird alliances between like socialists and anarchists, right? And some of the, what we could call libertarians over here sometimes are affiliate with what people call the, the anarcho-capitalist, or right? You know, essentially anarchists, right? Or 
it's this, this synthesis of free exchange, but public control. And to me, that is a synthesis of the two. And, you know, and, and what I'm trying to do here and in, and, and in my, um, you know, I guess you'll say activism with, you know, all the media I do, I'm always trying to bridge the gaps between right people that are left and right because I think that working people, whether whatever you identify with, if we can get the definitions reframed, we're going to find that we actually are saying pretty much the same thing. There's a few areas that are nuanced. There's other areas that we have to work out is, is, that we don't really know how it'll work. But to me, that's a synthesis of the two. And I'll leave it. I, that's the last thing I'll say. Like I said, I know that you're saying it to you that, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I have described is you're saying that is socialism formulated in its true in its, in its true uh, vision, right? And, and did I did I put words in your mouth? <clears throat> um, I mean, the properties you mentioned, so uh, commercial exchange or um, others you mentioned, I mean, that's totally compatible with pre-capitalist systems because it was existent. I mean, we, we also had, of course, commercial exchange before capitalism came into being, right? So I don't see any... Um, implication from capitalism to these properties themselves so i would disagree on that well real quick on that just real quick so earlier you had said in capitalism that there's a false freedom right and the idea is that you said you're not free to not work but that also right predates i mean that's just like living out in the woods by yourself you gotta put some labor out you know you gotta find a way to get some food i mean that's <laughs> No, it's a different situation, you see, because in capitalism, uh, what I described is a mode of the ruling class to extract surplus value. If you're living in the woods and are forced to, uh, to, to collect food or whatever, that's not a activity uh, someone gets a surplus value from. So the fundamentally different situation. Yeah, but but the other part of it is right. I mean, as an individual, you can also accumulate surplus labor. Correct, right? I mean, you can start your own business. You can dis you no, can no, negotiate with one company versus another. So when we this take is what I mean by free by a certain degree of free exchange, like there's not the state saying like this is your job. This is what you got to do. If you don't do it, there is no other option. That that's and maybe that's pre-capitalist, maybe it's pre-feudal, but it's not necessarily the case in any of the totalitarian regimes we've mentioned, either state communist or right fascist, right? And so that's that's what I mean when I'm talking about free, maybe commercial wasn't the best term, but a certain free exchange of labor. And maybe my example of foraging in the woods wasn't very uh, appropriate either. <laughs> I mean, surplus value extraction uh, is not something you can apply to yourself. That's, a, that's impossible if we take this term in the Marxist tradition, right? Because surplus extraction is an operation that the non-producers apply to the um, labor force of those that produce. And, the, and the, both of these classes are disjoint. So no non-producer is a producer or vice versa, right? So surplus value is different from profit then? Yeah. Okay, I, profit, that's, profit. that's in my mind, I just, it just clicked. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, surplus value is profit, but not every profit is surplus value. Surplus value is a very specific historical, um, um, how shall I say, um, a profile of, of profit, right? It has a, it, it, it is in some sense, the central part of, uh, of, of, uh, of uh, exploitation processes in, in capitalism. But of course, profit also existed before, right? I mean, the Florentine merchants of the 16th century, for instance, right? They also made profit, but they didn't make a profit in production. That's the first difference to a capitalist uh, surplus value extraction because surplus value is always uh, created in production. But Florentine merchants made their um, profits by, um, how shall I say, taking advantage of the existence of fragmented markets, right? So for instance, uh, they, they uh, bought goods in, in, in one, in one um, economic system, say, um, I don't know, Russia, right? Some corn or whatever, and brought it to, 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 uh, to Northern Italy uh, and, and, and sold it there for a certain price. And their profit was, of course, the difference between the purchase and their selling price, right? 
But this phenomenon is quite old, but in capitalism, profit has a very, very specific role. It's, it's tightly connected to a very specific form of, um, how shall I say, oppression, right? Namely, uh, wage labor uh, being based on a certain kind of property rights, which is also, also very uh, new, right? I, I mean, of course, property notions were also existence before, but we had a very uh, large a large tradition uh, above all in rural areas of a sort of common law property. So property uh, which was not exclusive, but which could be um, divided between different um, producers. But with capitalism, a very specific, entirely new notion of property emerges, which maybe for the first time takes clear shape in the work of John Locke, uh, according to which property is exclusive. So if, uh, uh, if uh, a person uh, possesses something, some, some good, uh, it's not entirely clear that another person may also use it or even possess it, right? And the other crucial aspect of that is, of course, that according to uh, Locke, uh, a person already then possesses an, an, a good or an object if uh, he or she is able to apply uh, working means to it so as to create a certain utility value in the sense of Marx, right? And if you take this notion of property, you have all the uh, justification, for instance, for enclosures in, uh, in, in, in uh, rural England, right? And this was also the case. I mean, this notion of property, which was provided by Locke, was then put into a sort of legislature or uh, legislation in, in Great Britain and was used for uh, driving people from their lands and was also used, by the way, uh, in order to justify uh, the uh, the massacres which were um, executed against the Indians in, uh, in, in in USA to gain their to gain hand on possession of their own lands. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so then all right, so then that that synthesis that I was trying to illustrate, you're saying that's not a synthesis of capitalism because I'm just talking about exchange of labor without the surplus value exploitation. Without yeah. that, that's not capitalism. That's yeah. just what you would consider a socialist form of economic exchange between workers. It doesn't have to be socialist. I mean, as I said, uh, such kind of exchanges already existed in antiquity. Okay. Or in feudalism. I mean, I, and, and the reason why I'm, why, I'm, why I'm even playing with this framework is because there's people who would write, as soon as you say socialist, they'll, they'll glaze over and they'll, they'll write, they'll carry a flag for what they think is capitalism. But, but I don't think that they think about the concept of surplus value exploitation. I think that a lot of people that are champions or apologists for capitalism, they think of it, they're just thinking of this, this thing that me and you were talking about now, if you're saying is the, the exchange of goods and services and labor, which, which is an element of any society. But I think that what they see, at least in most capitalist nations in the West, is that you had more options to choose where you worked. And, and so they see that when, when some of those people, right, who, who, who might not be willing to listen to what a socialist has to say, they hear, when they think of capitalism, they think of, right, this vague concept of free markets and, this, and the individual choices that you have within that, right? But what you're saying is that, right, that, that you have to take into account the, the element of exploitative surplus labor uh, and any system that has that is capitalist. Anyone that doesn't have that, regardless of whether it still has those things that people see as the core of capitalism, right? So, you know, it was some individual choice and, you know, the ability to, you know, move from company to company and, and maybe climb up the, the, the social ladder, that, that that is not actually necessarily capitalist, right? That that, that, that model or, or that those, those things that are conceived of as, the benefits of capitalism that they could, those they exist in other systems and or could be at least transferred to other systems. Yeah. Right. I'm Very informative. Point. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or is time over? Or what? Well, I figured since I took you a half hour, I was going to go ahead and let you all like plug whatever kind of stuff. But okay. go ahead if you want to get. I'll just uh, add a quick point here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the phenomenon you mentioned is uh, quite fascinating fascinating from a historical perspective. So the phenomenon that many people nowadays consider the, um, uh, let's say, historically more neutral processes like um, 
commercial exchange and so on as, uh, as defining capitalism. I mean, there was also once a time in the US where there was a quite strong labor movement and where large portions of the US society were quite conscious of what capitalism actually is, right? And it's a quite astonishing uh, success of corporate and state propaganda that these notions and this, this consciousness and the uh, associated concepts have virtually disappeared, right? In my opinion. And it's a, certainly a, how shall I say, a, one of the pillars of the stability of the current system, at least in the US, right? That people tend to think that capitalism was always there and is somehow even related to their very own human nature, right? I mean, there are various books on, on, on these topics, um, very influential research here. For instance, there's the um, monograph by Elizabeth uh, Phones Wolf, Selling Free Enterprise, uh, dating from um, nine, 1994, I think, where she um, uh, reconstructs this process of somehow making the masses unconscious in great detail. It's a quite good book for that. Yeah, actually, you know, that's, I, I'll leave you with this and I'll send it to you too. I wrote a couple articles uh, for Unlimited Hangout recently and uh, dug into the history of corporate collusion with <laughs> the teachers unions, right? And that's why I've been trying to, you know, find other teachers and organize with teachers uh, like uh, Michael Kane in New York uh, City. Basically, he created his own caucus and brought about I don't know how many people out of the United Federation of Teachers, but he had about 3,000 people at a rally. He basically said, as you mentioned, right, the labor movement, which over time, you know, sort of coalesced into these these monolithic uh, unions that, that they, that as I as I've documented, and people can check them out on uh, Unlimited Hangout. Uh, the unions at the top of the national unions, their their constituents are the corporation. They're not. They're not the, the workers anymore. And the only way to actually get any kind of a labor movement is to basically start from scratch and get into that discursive exchange on the, on the ground level right, right now. And, and so I, I totally agree with, with your, your assessment there. And I do think that, that that's really are the only thing that's going to turn the tide on, on uh, what's, what's going on uh, with all this right now, you know, and that's part of the reason by the way, in my opinion, why they, why we are isolated because, right, we can't actually find those other people. But the one thing we all have in common is we're all the people whose labor is being <laughs> exploited, right? And, you know, we need to find a way to uh, get out of the ideological boxes and, and, and actually, you know, turn that into some action through, through those exchanges. Uh, but I think that has to happen by having conversations like this, where people don't just dig their heels in on what they preconceive to be the case. They try to uh, pin down what they really mean when they say the words they say, right? And then hopefully that'll that'll turn into to, uh, an actual, uh, some kind of resistance and hopefully sooner than later. <laughs> so um, you guys have any final thoughts on anything you wanna add or you could share anything that, uh, stuff that's coming up uh, with GUI or individually, anything y'all are working on? Yeah, well, I mean, Luigi, I think we wanted to start a sort of project on intellectuals, right? That's at least, um, it should be coming up. Like uh, it's, uh, it's, it's combined with months of work, but definitely that's one of the main topics. Also, there are at least uh, two songs available, like in terms of artistic projection of um, the political values of GUI. Uh, they're actually in German language but at least listen to them for now until something in English is coming up, which will be definitely the case sooner or later. So that's, that's also my main uh, function in GUI is the artistic projection of the topics, which is also quite intricate because I have to work quite differently than I do usually when it's without the words which is obvious, but it's also a rather new field for me. So that's just uh, speaking about the arts. Intellectuals is coming up. 
we have the website of us we have telegram soundcloud mm. then then we had also a, a entire series about racism recently uh which can be heard in english um three series on that so that's currently what is going on in the core okay cool yeah and then and, and walter and then we'll, we'll uh send me some links uh after the after we uh wrap up here to all your you know the telegram and the website i'll put it in the description below as well yeah. walter do you have anything i mean I myself, I, I intend, besides the uh, uh, project concerning intellectuals, to focus more on the relation between capitalism and violence, right? Because much of the propaganda concerning capitalism is that it has led, even among Marxists, is that it has led to a steady increase of uh, direct oppression or violence. But um, if you look at the history of capitalism, this uh, assumption is not really that justified, right? And I'm, I intend to give some pointers to the relevant evidence. Very cool, man. I really appreciate you guys coming back to uh, have the uh, thorough discussion. I know I had, we had some more questions in there, but I think we got to like probably at least 80% of them. Mm -hmm. uh, I yeah. learned a lot. I hope other people did. Uh, and I hope that uh, we you know, uh, created some more dialogue, maybe bridged some gaps, uh, got people thinking about things in ways they weren't thinking. And um, maybe that hopefully this helps helps people do some some uh, organizing in the in the near future here. So uh, anytime y'all want to uh, you got a project, just let me know. I'll be happy to uh, share it and everything. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take it from here. Thanks. Thanks. Bye, bye bye. Thank you, John. Bye. Thank you. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, and share. If you'd like to check out more of my research, go to my website, schoolworldorder.info, where you can find archives of all my interviews, all my articles, and a bibliography of all my citations. There's also links to all my social media and video platforms, and you can sign up for my email list too where you will receive notifications whenever I produce a new article, interview, or video. To support my work, become a research member for just $5 a month, and you'll gain access to my WebBrain database, which contains Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet's archive of US Department of Education files and other rare historical documents. The database will be updated with weekly document dumps, and you will be notified whenever I upload a new dossier. Thanks again for watching. Peace.